Hello everybody, welcome to The Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today, I'm talking about album number five from music. Royal Astronomy. Right, now uh, that we've made it through all the biggest and most obvious classics in the Mike Paradinas catalog, this is actually the point where things really start to get interesting. Lunatic Harness may have shown him shifting his sound away from the more raw and aggressive melodic techno and IDM he cut his teeth on towards a much more well-polished and cerebral drum and bass style and saw more success than he'd ever seen before. But it wasn't a shift that turned out to stick longer term. Instead, it turned out to be the start of a run of projects where he would continually reinvent his style from the ground up and give each new album a wholly unique identity that none of his other albums had. And I don't think there's any better demonstration of that newfound sense of adventurousness than this album, Royal Astronomy, his last to be released on a major label, and quite possibly the single most divisive project in his catalog. People who wanted him to just make Lunatic Harness again picked this up and got a project that had almost none of the same appeal. Gone was a lot of the frantic drum programming, cerebral approach, and overall polished sound. In its place was a relentlessly goofy mix of bombastic midi orchestral sounds, hip-hop breakbeats, and maybe even a trip-hop-ish guest vocalist on a couple of tracks. Gone was the more cohesive and single-minded approach to the previous album. In its place was a set of 14 tracks that seemed to have little to no thematic throughline and shot all over the place stylistically. And the lead single, The Fear, was the closest he'd ever come to making regular old pop music. Needless to say, this wasn't exactly a move that went over well with all his fans, or the critics either. A lot of them were fairly mixed on it at the time, and a few of them even went as far to say that it was a bit of a commercial compromise for him and an all-around disappointment. On the other hand, as many people as I've seen talking about this album as a letdown, I see just as many who consider it to be one of his best works. And as you might tell from the fact that I sprung for the CD, Yes, I am one of those people. <laughs> While I can understand this album's detractors, I don't personally agree with them at all, and I think this project is properly great. It's one of my favorites in his catalog. Thing is, I look at a project like Lunatic Harness, I see the appeal of it, I can respect it as the game changer that it is, but I don't think it's as special by today's standards as it might have been back in 1997. There's plenty of albums out there from all number of different artists over multiple decades that follow in that project's footsteps and took a very similar approach, maybe resulting in that project's original appear ending up a bit watered down in the process, I guess? Royal Astronomy, on the other hand, has no copycats. It is a wholly one-of-a-kind experience. <laughs> I've never heard any other album quite like it. The way it brings together these elements of classical music and hip-hop with his usual lighthearted IDM flares all ends up sounding like it could be the soundtrack to some kind of off-the-wall, campy kids cartoon show starring some cool kid character with 90s attitude who wears a backwards baseball cap and skateboards and uh, has to defeat some ridiculous over-the-top Disney villains for some reason. <laughs> and it's animated in like the same style as like the Magic School Bus and Captain Planet and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and that kind of stuff. Definitely the kind of thing that makes perfect sense having been released in 1999, but any dated elements or comparative lack of mastering polish is especially seen in how obviously fake all the orchestral instrumentation is. All of that only directly adds to the charm for me, and as many stylistic jumps as this project makes, it all seems to make just enough sense existing in the same universe and being packaged together. It's ridiculous, it's monstrously cheesy, and it's a ton of fun. The album certainly starts out with its best foot forward in its opening moment, starting with the track Scaling, which immediately hits you with all the grandiose synth strings and timpanies and bells, really conveying the sense of cartoon villainish, over-the-top intensity that I've always really enjoyed whenever uh, Paradinas tries exploring it any time before or after this. And the album's true colors are shown in even more full force on the following track, The Witchy Song which combines a similar blend of MIDI orchestrations, combining the fake timpanies and violins and woodwinds, with a banging hip-hop beat, complete with DJ scratching and samples of 90s rapper ad-libs. It is some of the most unabashedly goofy stuff I've heard in my life, and it is absolutely freaking glorious. These kinds of MIDI orchestrations are also explored on a number of other tracks scattered throughout the track listing. See Slice, uh, which combines these elements and one of the most openly Bach-sounding chord progressions with all these plinking synth arpeggios and a whole bunch of chopped up and glitched up breakbeats. Or Gruber's Mandolin, which has all these spooky but still playful string progressions that keep, like, falling over each other 
other and have a particular like Halloween-ish vibe to them that I find very charming. Or lead single The Fear, which combines uh, the synth orchestrations with a guest vocal appearance from Kazumi. As I sort of mentioned above, she's got a slight bit of like a sultry trip-hop-ish tinge to her voice, but she does fit surprisingly well into this mix of very cheerful uh, synth strings and clattering marching percussion. She actually does well to give the whole cut a, a more of an emotional core. And of course there's also Mentim, which takes all of these excessively distorted synth harpsichords and blasts them into a cloud of abrasive noise and wiry pads, creating a particularly overbearing effect that I was initially kind of iffy on, but grew on me uh, quite a bit the more I listened to this thing. It is quite possibly the single spookiest and darkest moment for the album, and the one moment on this thing that succeeds in being properly unsettling instead of, like, the cartoonish kind of unsettling. But of course, grandiose midi orchestrations aren't the only thing the album has to offer. There are other tracks that sound nothing like these. Take Autumn Acid, for instance, which sounds like it could be bridging the gap between, like, uh, the propeller heads and Aphex Twins window licker, hitting you with all these skittering and crashing break beats, raw acid synths, and bizarrely muted and off-kilter wordless vocal harmonies. I will admit I'm not crazy about the incorporation of vocals on this particular track. They can come off a bit on the unpleasant side, but I still have plenty of fun whenever this track comes up. And there are lots of other fun, frantic breakbeat workouts. See all the chopped up amen breaks going up next to some funkier sets of plinking electric piano melodies on Carpet Muncher, or the slight clusterfuck that is World of Leather, with that brings in everything from foot tapping breaks and wiry leads to keyboards that vaguely resemble steel drums to more various synth string orchestrations to even some vocoder vocals for good measure. And it still manages to find a vaguely low stakes and laid back mood through all of its crazy layers of sounds. And of course, we gotta give special mention to the album's longest track, the seven minute centerpiece, The Motorbike Track, which has to also be the biggest breakbeat banger of them all. Chopping all these breaks up, combining them with various driving acid bass progressions, and of course, periodically sticking in samples of Gangstar's royalty, asking you to knock that shit off for real, know what I'm saying? Goes unbelievably hard, keeps me totally invested over that entire length, despite not having a ton of progression. I will say the album does take a slight bit of a downturn in a stretch of a couple of tracks near the end that, while all nice, don't pull me in quite as well as earlier cuts could. You get the somewhat forgettable interlude Scrape, which has some nice uh, string melodies, but presents them in their harshest and, I suppose, scrapiest texture yet. You got 56, which I suppose is trying to be the more chill companion to Autumn Acid, with a similar mix of breaks with various layers of bubbling melodies and a few vocal harmonies. Said harmonies are less grating and muddy here, but the actual melodic and chord progressions here are among some of the least pleasant and most downtrodden on the album. And then Burst Your Arm, I guess, is trying to serve as a similar purpose to the motorbike track in all its mix is of frantic breakbeats and intense acid synths and later some more chopped up rapper samples stretching over six and a half minutes. Though this one isn't quite as strong. Uh, the acid synths are markedly more upfront in the mix than the beats and there's an odd hollowness to the sound of the track. Perhaps a slight lack of low end, leading to the sound of this one feeling a bit underwhelming in comparison. It still provides just enough of a rush to remain generally fun, but the motorbike track is very obviously better in my eyes, and perhaps it's that direct comparison which, le which led me to mark this as my least favorite. Still a good track though. But this run of lesser cuts is all made up for with the closer, Goodbye Goodbye, which... Even the people who don't like this album have still generally been able to agree that this is the biggest highlight out of everything on here, or even go as far as to say this track is so good it makes the entire album worth the purchase on its own. And, uh, yeah, I'm inclined to agree. It's another track with a guest vocal appearance from Kazumi, but this one utilizes her voice even better than The Fear did, uh, by actually making a track as sultry and emotional to match her voice. She fits so perfectly next to all the low-key blubbering synth bass, minimal tapping percussion, and various quirky melodic textures. Even the synth strings brought in are markedly easier to take seriously here than anywhere else on the project. There is still like a bit of clipping audio around this track, and it's not the most polished production he's ever delivered, uh, but the track is still so undeniably beautiful. Makes for such a strong ending that this album almost didn't even deserve, and it's one of the best tracks Paradiness has ever made. And yeah, that's everything on Royal Astronomy. 
Man, I don't care what anyone says, this project is great. <laughs> I can definitely understand why a lot of people weren't crazy about it. The production is a noticeable step down from Lunatic Harness. There's so many wildly different styles being explored here, to the point where it might not even make sense coming together as a whole. There's way more of a tongue-in-cheek silliness that permeates through everything, and the incorporations of hip-hop elements make for some of the most instantly dated moments in Paradinus's catalog. But none of this stuff bothers me. I'll admit that it isn't the kind of album that I feel the urge to put on all the time, it's maybe the kind of project that I have to be in the right mood for sometimes, but it's still such a wholly unique experience that you really can't get anything like elsewhere, and all the sillier and cheesier elements only directly add to the charm for me, as do the more obviously dated elements. Because the thing about this project is, I mean, it may not be the goofiest or silliest material that Paradinus ever came up with, at least not with expert knob twiddlers sitting right there, but it is maybe the most overtly dorky a uh, music album has ever been. And it's completely self-assured in its dorkiness. There's no pretensions towards being cool or hip with this stuff, even with the trendier hip-hop elements. Those kind of just make the whole mix come off even goofier, and I get the feeling Paradinus was fully aware of that when he made this stuff. You do not put timpanis over DJ scratching without knowing exactly how seriously you're going to be taken. But that ironically makes this album age way better by today's standards. It's the kind of thing that he could have fairly easily gotten away with even now in 2023, and it, and it could have made sense. Because at the end of the day, he's just clearly, genuinely having a lot of fun with this stuff, and that's the primary purpose of it, just to have fun. How much you decide to go along with the unbridled cartoonishness of this album will obviously vary quite heavily from person to person. I would get it if you didn't like this, but I've always found it to be exceptionally charming. I would absolutely recommend it regardless. It's again one of my favorite projects of his, and I'm overall feeling a strong 8.3 out of 10. But of course, this is all just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters, they're awesome people. You want to add yourself that list, link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.